All right, guys, let's uh, get started with the second part of the lecture. And we have three main uh, topics here. Uh, the one you're looking for, which is how do I learn um, these parameters from data? And that's gonna come second. And first we need to show you how you can evaluate an PSDD to compute marginal probabilities. Uh, this is more general than what I showed you earlier, because what I showed you earlier, how do you compute the probability of a full variable instantiation? But now I'm going to show you how to compute the probability for any variable instantiation, even if it's partial. And that would subsume what we did in the first part. So, uh, and then we'll do uh, uh, learning. And then the last thing is conditional PSTDs. Okay, guys. So just very quick um, a review here of what we mean by marginal probabilities. Remember the slide that we started with. I do have a distribution. A PSDD specifies one of these. And then I come to you and I say, what is the probability that A is true? And then you have to add up a whole bunch of probabilities to get that. Okay, and you can write even uh, more complex expressions in general, like what is the probability that the alarm triggered or there was a burglary? Same story, right? You just have to look for the uh, uh, worlds that satisfy this and add up their probabilities. And you can see why this is important because then I compute conditional probabilities from that. So let's see how we can compute marginal probabilities on PSDDs. Uh, the main insight here is I want you to think of a fragment like this. Remember, PSDDs are made up of fragments like this. They just repeat, right? This is what we call the XY decomposition. Prime sub, prime sub, da, da, da. And we have these weights that are sitting on the wires. Think of it as this arithmetic circuit, as doing this computation. What am I doing here? I'm multiplying P1 by P2 because that's this guy. Think of this as doing a multiplication, 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 and addition. I am multiplying these two numbers. I'm gonna get a number here. And then I multiply that by the weight. Similarly, multiply this by this by the weight. Multiply this by this by the weight. And what do I do? I add these guys up. That's what you're seeing here, okay? So you're doing this, multiplying prime sub weight, and then you're doing this, and then you're doing this, and then you're adding them up. That's basically it. That's gonna be the process we're gonna use. And you're gonna see how this will compute marginal probabilities. Now, the only thing that's missing is the base cases, right? So let's look at this example. Uh, this is a PSDD and it actually represents this distribution, okay? Now, if I give you the numbers on this and this and this and that, I already showed you how to take these four numbers and produce a number there. Similarly for this guy, if I gave you the numbers on these four guys here, you know what to do here. The question is just the, 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 leaf, the leaves or the base cases and that's all we have to cover. Uh, so here's the rule, very simple, and you've seen this before. And the reason it works like this, because this is actually a deterministic and decomposable circuit. So we need to assign the values. If you give me a, 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 an event and you say, what is the probability of that event? I need to produce numbers for these um, leaves. And the rule is simply, the value of a leaf, which is a literal, this is a literal, positive literal, positive literal, negative literal, the value of a literal given evidence E is defined like this, the value of literal L. It is zero if that literal is inconsistent with the evidence E, otherwise it's one. Okay, that's what we've done. Remember when we were doing model counting on uh, deterministic and decomposable circuits. Let's take an example. Here's the uh, and, and I'm having two copies of this because I'm gonna mark one of them and I wanted to keep the other one clean. And here's the evidence, okay? The evidence is that A is true and B is false and C is true. I wanna compute the probability of this according to this PSDD. Remember, the number I should be getting is, uh, what is it? This is true, false, true, it should be this guy. So what do I do? It's very simple. I have to replace these literals by numbers and then I evaluate the circuit as we just mentioned. Okay, um, what, here's A, in the evidence A is true. So I have this guy, what, what numbers this should this guy get? Type something here. I should replace this by what number? One. What about this guy? Not A, zero, excellent. So that's what's gonna happen. And for B, it's gonna be the other way around because this is consistent with the evidence. It gets one, this is inconsistent, it gets zero, and, and here's the value. So I do the substitution and, okay, I'm gonna take these literals out and replace them by numbers. 
and then I evaluate as I did in the previous slide. What does that mean? You multiply one by zero by this. You multiply zero by one by this. You, and then you add them up, you get a number, da, da, da. And if you do this, you should get a three over seven at the very top, okay? Which is the probability of this guy. Now, that was not an interesting thing because that is the probability of a full variable instantiation. What if we have a partial variable instantiation like this guy? And now I wanna compute the probability of uh, this event. What should I get as far as a number? What is that marginal probability for this guy? Here's the table, remember? Okay, people are saying four over seven, right? Because A is true, you will be adding up uh, those four guys. So you should be getting four over seven. Okay, now let's go and do it. Uh, I have to assign the values for all of the literals. So for A, I'm gonna get this, we've seen that, uh, because this is consistent, it gets a one, this is inconsistent with the evidence, it gets a zero. What should I get for B? B and not B, what should I get for B? What should I replace it with? B, someone is saying one. What should I replace not B? Someone is saying, okay, people are saying everything else should get a one, exactly. Both of these are consistent because this guy is silent on the variable B. And both of these gets one because this guy is silent on that. So. Now I'm gonna put these numbers down. Okay, I didn't cross, it's there in green. And then if you, if you evaluate the circuit, you're gonna get four over seven at the top, okay? Now, what is the significance of this? The significance of this is what we call that the PSDD is tractable. It can compute marginal probabilities in linear time, okay? So um, that is actually fantastic news. And um, we're, we're starting, I don't know if you guys are realizing this. This is like a version, uh, yes, linear in the in the number of gates um, in, in the PSDD. One way to look at this, this is like uh, a, a principal type of neural networks in the sense that they represent distributions and these distributions are computable uh, in linear time in the circuit size feed forward. And here's the big deal, guys. If you try to learn these, I'm gonna show you how to, to learn these numbers in an unsupervised fashion. And if you learn these parameters in a supervised fashion, like people do in neural networks, like here's the input, here's the output I should get. Here's the input, here's the output I should get. And use gradient descent to learn these probabilities, which you can, you are guaranteed that regardless of what numbers you learn, you are guaranteed that any infeasible state will be getting the probability zero. So these are in a sense like neural networks with, with physics embedded in them. Physics of the world, the physics here being logical constraints. This is a holy grail for neural networks. People don't know how to do this with neural networks. Now they're not as expressive as in neural networks, but I'm just giving an, you an analogy to see how important this is. Uh, this is very difficult to attain, all right? So regardless of what gradient descent will do to learn these numbers, you're still getting assurances, which is pretty nice. Okay, now let's talk about learning. And, and I did mention supervised and unsupervised earlier, and I mentioned it here again. Let me loosely say once more what, it, what is supervised at least, because what we're gonna see next is unsupervised. Supervised is, in this context where you wanna learn these guys, but your data is in the form of input output. So here's an event, here's what its probability should be. Here's another variable instantiation, here's what the probability should be, da, da. This is a, a simplification. You can do more sophisticated things. And then you basically try to learn these numbers so that this circuit start actually kind of imitating your data, okay? That would be the supervised version. You can do it with these guys because you guys know that these guys are differentiable, remember? Uh, when, when you go to this, you can replace this circuit by what we showed you here, um, right? You can do back propagation on this and compute partial derivatives with respect to these and apply gradient descent. Okay, just a side comment. But let's go to what we want to do here, which is unsupervised learning. So here's the deal. The deal is going back to this example because we're gonna use it to illustrate learning and, and the learning part is gonna be pretty simple. Uh, I had my constraints that defined um, 
uh, as SDD circuit and I parameterized it, but I don't know the numbers. And I have data on what students have done. And I want to learn from this data, those parameters. So I want to settle one thing first. Uh, what does it mean to learn? So if I told you, okay, here's an algorithm and it does the following. It takes this data and it takes the SDD circuits and computes its parameters like that. What assurances am I giving you, right? Uh, I mean, any of us could do this. You may guess these numbers. So here's an important principle uh, because the method that I'm gonna give you comes with an assurance. And this is like a standard assurance that comes from machine learning and statistic. And the idea is I want not any parameters. I want to learn what people call maximum likelihood parameters. What's this idea? The idea is pretty simple. Here's your data set, okay? And, and we, we call each one of these an example, okay? So you can think of your data set as a set of examples. Now, each example is a variable instantiation. It's an event. Now, you have to be careful here. This data set it contains six examples of this type. So when I'm doing this, you have to unfold. If I don't put counts and I just put example, 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 you have to produce six replicas of this guy here and 54 replicas of that guy, okay? That means I've seen six students that did this. I've seen 54 students that did that, okay? So when you list examples like this, they may have duplicates. Now, you come and tell me, listen, I have a model like a PSDD and I can parameterize it. This theta, think of it as all of the numbers you can put on the PSDD. And every time I put them, I get a different distribution. So I'm, I'm putting subscript here, the distribution induced by the PSDD if you were to use these parameters. Of course, this notion doesn't have to be a PSDD. Many other models like Bayesian networks are parameterized and every time you change the parameters, you get a different distribution. Now, the point is, I want to tell you, if you come and give me two different parameterization, how do I distinguish them? Which one is better? So there is this principle of the likelihood of the parameters. So the idea is I'm going to judge the quality of some parameterization by what, how well it explains the data. And this is called the likelihood of these parameters. It's written like this, right? And it's effectively the probability that I will see this data set under this kind of parameterization. And how does this work? Well, listen, here's the parameterization. I want to see how good it is. I'm going to plug it into to my model. I'm going to get a distribution. I'm going to go to this distribution and say, what is the probability of the first example? What's the probability of the second example? What's the probability of the third example? And I just multiply them and I get a number. And this number is the score of how good this parameterization is. And uh, that's known as the likelihood. And what people want to do is find the maximum likelihood parameters. That is, I want to find a parameterization that maximizes this quantity, okay? That's one principle of learning. And uh, when your data is complete, what does that mean? Uh, that means for every example, I know the value of every variable. Look, here are six students, but I know exactly what each one of them did. I, they didn't take this, didn't take this, took this, didn't, didn't take that. This is known as a complete data set. Sometimes, you may not know certain things. So for this here, you may have a question mark saying, look, here are three students. I know they took this and this. I have no idea what they did on this one, but they took this. The reason I'm mentioning this distinction between incomplete and complete, because the extent to which this criteria is behaved or not well behaved depends on whether your data is complete or not. When the data is complete, like we have, in our example, this is pretty robust criteria. If the data is incomplete, then it's uh, more involved, but we're focusing here on complete data for now. Are we good so far? Because what we're gonna do is not only show you how to learn the parameters of the PSDD, but I'm gonna show you that the method I'm gonna show you next, which is uh, very simple, will end up learning maximum likelihood parameters. That is, we'll end up learning those parameters that maximizes the probability of your data set. Okay, are we ready for the next slide? Fantastic, let's do it. Okay, here's how it works, guys. And, and this is what I was just saying, that the difficulty and properties depend on the type of data. Here's what we're gonna do. This PSTD was generated for uh, this course's example, and here's my data set. So you're gonna do something very simple. You're gonna go to your probabilities, the parameters, and zero them all out. And look what we're gonna do. 
we're going to walk through the examples one by one. And uh, remember, when we look at the first row, we're really seeing six examples, not just one. And I'm going to evaluate the circuit at that example, right? That's a full uh, example. So I can evaluate the circuit. Now, what's going to happen here? Remember, this is a PSDD. It is deterministic and decomposable. There is this notion of a sub-circuit. I know, so this example is in my uh, probability space, in the structured space. If I evaluate the circuit at that, I'm going to get a one. And these end up being the, the sub-circuit if I start at the top and I trace the high wires, remember? For an OR gate, I must have exactly one input that's high. For an AND, all will be high in this case. And I keep going down, down, down. And what do I do? For every count that I encountered, I incremented by six. Okay, look at it. it they were all zeros and now they're all six. And then I do this for the second example. And if you look at the second example, it was zero, zero, one, zero. This only difference is between these guys. So you're only gonna see the difference somewhere here. Now, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna identify a sub-circuit like this. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna add 54 to each of the counts. So that's how it's gonna look like. Uh, the only difference between the sub-circuit for this and that was here. So this was zero, it became 54. And I added 54 to the, all of the other guys. Okay, and then you keep going. Uh, for this example, I end up getting this sub-circuit, so I increment the counts by 10. That's it. You end up passing through the whole set, and then at the end, what do you do? You normalize. You're going to get numbers here, you just normalize them. And th those are your parameter estimates, and they're guaranteed to be your maximum likelihood parameter estimates. Yes. And Eli, the reason, the reason, this is, this is where I, I can't stress this enough. The reason you're getting all of this excellent behavior is because of the properties of the underlying Boolean circuit. You can't imagine how things simplify even in probabilistic reasoning when you do the right things at the Boolean level. Folks, this is something that is unfortunately is not part of the way we get educated these days. Even a probability distribution. A probability distribution is sitting over what? Is over events. A probability distribution is a property of a symbolic phenomena. Uh, it is assigning numbers to symbolic creatures. And what people underappreciate is how much something like probabilistic reasoning and learning get facilitated if you get a good handle over the underlying uh, symbolic space that they are trying to talk about. Because you think about probabilities as numbers, yes, but what are they talking about? They, they are properties of symbolic things, events. And you get all of this uh, good behavior because I did some hard work initially to take my space of events and factor it as an SDD circuit, all right? And you get even more properties based on that. So really being competent and figuring out symbolic manipulations plays a big role in doing probabilistic and machine learning uh, computations. Okay, guys. Now, listen, I want to do a couple of more things on PSDDs. I'm going to run through these relatively quickly just to tell you how uh, versatile this representation is. Um, they may make more sense to some of you than others. but And then I'm going to go to the last segment, which is conditional PSDDs. That's an even in a sense, more, more remarkable and subtle uh, representation. Uh, what I wanted to uh, do is first tell you uh, along the lines that I was just saying about if you figure out your uh, symbolic stuff, uh, how uh, not only you can do certain things easily, but you can start seeing things that people missed. We talked about the notion of incomplete versus complete data sets. This is the classical distinction made in the machine learning literature. And a complete data set is, as we mentioned, let's say you have three variables. That means in every example, you know precisely the value of the variable, okay? Like what we just saw on the previous, this is a complete data set. And as we've seen for the PSDDs, I can get the maximum likelihood parameters in that case. Um, using this simple procedure. Now, an incomplete data set, as it is uh, discussed in the machine learning literature, looks like this. Uh, you have question marks. So I no longer know, uh, for this example, what's the value of that. In that case, 
for PSDDs, you can still estimate parameters, maximum likelihood parameters, but you need a more involved algorithm known as EM, which is typically used for other kind of models to learn maximum likelihood parameters. I have to warn you though, uh, the problem with uh, incomplete data sets is first, the maximum likelihood parameters are no longer unique. So, uh, and the EM algorithm tries to approximate one of them. The fact that they're not unique makes this uh, principle of uh, maximum likelihood parameters uh, questionable in that case, because it, it's not good enough to distinguish between different uh, parameter estimates. If you uh, follow the work on causality, for example, uh, where people use beyond probabilistic reasoning, they think about causality, <laughs> that would be a no-no, <laughs> because uh, you can learn two different set of parameters under the maximum likelihood principles that will not make sense. One of them will make a lot of sense, the other will not make at all sense from a causal point of view. So, but the, the point I wanted to make here is the following. Here's a punchline, complete incomplete. Now, when you think about what happened with incomplete, um, let's think of these as students, right? So this says, I've seen a student and I know everything about them, okay? And this thing, I've seen a student, but I only know the following about them. I have no idea about this property of that student. That is a notion of incompleteness, but that's a limited notion of incompleteness. In principle, if you wanna do incompleteness, I should allow you to say anything you want about this student. Not necessarily either I know the value of every variable or I know the value of some variables, but not the others. And what does that mean? I want to allow you to write a Boolean event, to write a Boolean formula, that says, this is what I know about that individual. And this leads to something that here we're calling non-classical incomplete data sets, that they're not used in the literature, but the, conceptually, nothing prohibits them, right? So I could tell you, I've seen a student and all I can tell you is, uh, whatever they did in X, they did on Z. So these have the same value and I have no idea what they did on this. Or I can tell you, okay, I've seen a student, I know for X, it was this value, or all I can tell you is Y, could be this or Z could be that, right? What prohibits me from describing an example using a Boolean formula? It, mathematically, even if you go to EM maximum likelihood, none of this actually is a barrier. Uh, part of the reason is, if you wanna think about it, this is a very specific Boolean event, a full variable instantiation. This is a very specific Boolean formula, which we called a term. And this is what we called the Boolean formula. They're all legitimate. Now, why do people only focus on these? Computational reasons, computational reasons. If you look in the literature on machine learning and probabilistic reasoning, people don't know how to deal easily with probabilities of arbitrary events. Almost all of the literature is focused on probabilities of either a variable instantiation or a partial variable instantiation. I will put uh, in the, in the uh, uh, optional readings, uh, a paper that shows how you can learn with these kind of data sets, right? Now, where does this come up? Let me show you. Remember our example from total orderings? Let's say the variables are what is in the first position, what's in the second position, what's in the third position, right? And what we have here is a complete data set. I've seen someone and I know everything about them. I know what is their first preference, what's their second, what's their third. That's complete data set. Classical incomplete data set would put some question marks. So I've seen someone, I know that their first choice is tuna and their second choice is tuna roll. I have no idea what their third choice is, but I know actually their fourth and so on. Okay, what can you do if you allow arbitrary Boolean expressions to describe examples. You can do the following. I can tell you, okay, here's a customer. And I know that fatty tuna is more preferred than sea ocean. They put this as a higher position than that. And I know that they prefer tuna over sea eel. And that's all I'm telling you, right? And here I can tell you, here's another a user, I know that fatty tuna is their first and I know that they prefer a salmon roe over egg. And that's all I'm gonna tell you. Conceptually, that's useful information and I should be able to learn from that. And the PSDD framework because, and, and, and because it's all based on this fancy logic can actually deal and learn from these kind of data sets. Okay, this is another example. When you have a good handle on symbolic reasoning, you can do fancier thing even when you do probabilistic reasoning 
or a machine learning. And I see here a question about uh, is the, uh, the idea that I've mentioned about learning from these uh, versus those computational. Yes, partly computational and partly formulation. <laughs> You have to formulate it. You have to be comfortable writing the right equations. And almost every equation that you see in the probabilistic reasoning and machine learning, when you do this, beta, this guy ends up being a partial variable instantiation. You want to start being able to put arbitrary Boolean formulas there. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's part of the definition of conditional probability, but we're not accustomed to doing this. And most of the machinery that has been developed has been developed for conditioning on partial variable instantiations, okay? It's just not common, not mainstream. There is nothing wrong with it conceptually though. The math all still works. Okay, let me see. I still have 20 minutes. Uh, I need to quickly skip the next few slides and go to conditional PSDDs, the last concepts. I need at least 15 minutes there. So let's do that. Ah, well, someone asked before about how big these things can get. The idea of routes uh, was scaled and, as I mentioned, was used to compile maps that are basically on the order of small countries. Uh, in this example, this is an actual case study that comes from uh, one of our previous graduate students, uh, Jason Shen, where this part of San Francisco was compiled into a PSDD that had uh, a few million nodes. And then the distributions, the parameters were learned from GPS data, from actual trips that people took. Actually, in this experiment was interesting. They, they were used in this case to do route completions. So I, I, here's the source, here's the destination. And I tell you someone's going from this place to that place. And I know they've done this so far. What's the most likely completion of the route? And in another example, it was used to distinguish between uh, drivers. Uh, this is an interesting story. There's a data set from San Francisco that dates back to before uh, we had uh, basically navigation systems for taxi drivers. And what happened in this experiment is you take that data set, and this is when people were still driving based on skill, right? They were not using Google or Uber routes and so on. And in this experiment, for these uh, trips, uh, this was one data set, and another data set uh, was based on Google Routes. You can go to Google and actually uh, get route recommendation and even buy if you want to do too many. So there was two different data sets, one for taxi drivers from skill and another based on Google map recommendations. And there was an application is, if I give you the routes, can you distinguish? And uh, this was actually doing almost beyond 99% accuracy telling if this was a route taken before or after uh, Google uh, Maps. Okay, very quick remarks before I get to the last concept, uh, which is conditional PSDDs. Uh, the fact that um, these representations are not just for distributions. Uh, there is this notion of a factor that comes from probabilistic reasoning and machine learning, which is any mapping from variable instantiations to real numbers. They don't have to be probabilities between zero and one. They don't have to add up to one, but let's say positive uh, real numbers. And you can think of a factor as a distribution with a normalizing constant, right? So you can normalize these, you get this, it's a distribution, and then you keep the normalizing constant seven. So you can represent this guy by a PSDD and a number. And then you can do other things beyond what we talked about here. Uh, main result you should know about is that when you think of a PSDD plus a number as representing a factor, here's one representing this factor, here's one representing this factor. There is the notion of multiplying two factors. Uh, I'm showing the simple version of it when both factors are over the same variables. It ends up being just a pointwise multiplication, but in general, these could be over different sets of variables. The point is uh, PSDDs can be multiplied in quadratic time. So when you use them to represent factors in this fashion, you can multiply them and therefore multiply the underlying factors that they represent in quadratic time. And that ends up having all kinds of other applications. I'm gonna skip the applications, but I just want you to remember that fact. One application is doing major network inference, but let's go to the last concept. We have about 15 minutes for this. So what is conditional PSDDs? Uh, so PSDDs, represent distributions, right? So let's say you have variables x, 
y, z, and you're trying to represent a distribution over that. Often, you need to represent what we call conditional distributions. What does that mean? Uh, let's say we have another set of variables, x prime, y prime, z prime. So you may want to represent the distribution over x, y, z, um, given uh, x prime, y prime, z prime. So what's happening here is you want to think of this. OK, these z's are looking very funny. Uh, what you can think of this is as a family of distribution. Uh, in this case, I have. Uh, three variables, let's say they're all binary. So there is eight possible instantiations of these, right? There's eight possible instantiation. Each one of these generates a distribution over X, Y, Z. So really what I have in this particular case is eight different distributions, each conditioned on a particular value of uh, these variables. Comes up everywhere. Uh, if you're familiar with Markov uh, processes, these would correspond to what people call transition matrices. If you're familiar with Bayesian networks, these would correspond to conditional probability tables. That's what a, P a conditional PSDD does. And here's, I give you a concrete example. I have uh, four variables, A, B, X, Y, and I'm trying to compute a distribution over X, Y given A, B. So if you look at the variables A, B, uh, they could be in four possible states, right? Um, this is one of them. This is another, third, fourth. And you can see the corresponding distribution on X, Y under each one of these variable instantiations for A, B. Now, realize what happened here. Uh, two things happened. One is the thing we're familiar with. We have a lot of zeros. So these are logical constraints, which means if uh, when A and B have this value, X and Y can never take that value, da, da, da. And this is something that this will be captured. But the other thing, other phenomena, which is pretty important and significant, even though I have four different instantiations for A and B, look what happened here. I only have two distinct distributions over X and Y. What does that mean? That means if A has this value and B has that value, I know this is the distribution over X, Y. Otherwise, it's the other distribution. So these are in an equivalent class. One, two, three states of A, B do not change the distribution over X, Y. This is known as context-specific independence, right? And PS, conditional PSDDs excel at taking advantage of that structure. I'm gonna show you a picture of one and say a few things about it and will uh, basically be done there. So let me show you a picture. And before I show you the picture, I will alarm you. It's a hybrid creature. It's partly PSDD, partly SDD. Let's see it. Here it is. This is a conditional PSDD that represents uh, this conditional distribution. What's happening here? Two parts, an SDD component and a PSDD component. What's going on here? Let's focus here. This is not just one PSDD. It's what we call a multi-rooted PSDD. It has multiple roots. And you want to think about each one of them as representing one of these distributions. This PSDD here represents this distribution. We know how that works. This PSDD represents this distribution, the one in blue. Okay, we know how this works. And it happens that they share uh, parts. So think of this as not just a PSDD, but a generalization of PSDD where you have multi-outputs. Multi so it's something that represents multiple distribution. What is this guy doing? I want one word to, to tell me what do you think this guy is doing? This is a SDD component effectively over the variables A, B. And what do you think this is going to, this the role of this is going to be? that if I evaluated, uh, ah, thank you. Someone is saying deciding whether we are in pink or blue cases. Someone is saying choosing between the two equivalence classes. Absolutely. And look what happens. If I evaluate this guy at A, a value for A and a value for B, you know what happens? This is an SDD circuit. When I evaluate it on one of these guys, what is gonna do? You're gonna have a sub circuit. Let's, let's look at it here, it's fun. And, and before I forget, this brilliant representation uh, was also due to uh, Jason Chen, one of our uh, graduate students who just graduated last summer. Uh, look what happens here. Here, 
I'm, eva I'm evaluating, I'm, I'm going to evaluate this guy under different settings for A and B. Here I, I evaluate under A0, B0, and, and look at the hot subcircuit. It's pointing to this guy. That is actually is this distribution. And here I'm evaluating it under this particular instantiation. And look what happened. It ended up picking the other distribution. Now, if you were to evaluate it under A1, uh, B0 or under uh, A1, B1, again, this guy will be selected because remember, under all of these instantiations, it's this guy. So for any of these evaluations of the SDD component, you're going to pick this guy. Okay, that's basically the conditional PSDD representation. Now, there is one concept here for that we didn't talk about, which makes these things work. And I'm, I'm going to give you the hint. I'm going to mention a word. And, and you're going to try to say something about it. OK? Uh, let's look at this guy. V3. Remember, every PSDD or SDD must conform to a V3, correct? Now, if you see how these guys are staged, you've got this PSDD component over the variables x, y, and then you've got this SDD component over a, b. Can someone say anything of any sort relating to the V3 that this we need? Uh, someone is saying we need two V3s, almost. The point is, and I will take this to be uh, Ellie's answer is that, aha, uh -huh, okay, all right, I'm getting another answer. So I can't just use, what people are saying, I can't just use an arbitrary V3 in this case. Uh, uh, someone is saying I need two V3s and someone is saying I need the X to be A, B and the Y to be C, D, that I need to distinguish between um, the variables and absolutely. Uh, you need for this something that we call a conditional V3. It's a very simple concept. And let me uh, show it to you first, and then I'll, I'll go back to some of the things that I wanted to mention. Guys, um, the point is, uh, let's say I'm trying to build an SDD to compute the distribution over XY given AB, right? Which is the example we had. You cannot use an arbitrary V3 for this. You need to use, uh, in this case, it's called the conditional V3. Actually, this notion predates uh, conditional PSDD, it was actually uh, proposed earlier uh, by one of other graduate students, Umut Ustok, uh, under of the name constrained V3s. But here's the idea. The idea is, I want a V3 that satisfies the following condition. It must have a node in the V3, uh, one of these internal nodes, that has XY under it precisely. So the variables x, y have to be the only variables in some subtree, okay? Let's see, which one of these meet that criteria? Does this meet the criteria? Yes, x, y exactly under are the only variables in a subtree. So there's another condition, so yes. Does this meet the criteria? Yes. Does this meet the criteria? I need the variables, it does not. There is no single node under which the, the only variables are x, y. This is already gone. How about this guy? Does this meet the criteria? Yes. OK, that's the first condition. The second condition is that node, I'm going to mark them. So this is 1, and this is 1, and this is 1. That node has to be reachable from the root by only following right children. What does that mean? If I go from here to there, no, I didn't follow a right child. I followed a, a left child. If I go from here to there, what did I do? I followed a right child. So these nodes that contain precisely x, y below them has to be reachable from the root using by following only right children. Now, let's go to each one of these guys. Does this satisfy the criteria? Can I reach this guy by only following right children from the top? This guy. And people are saying yes, because I'm here, right child, right child. So actually, this is a real yes. 
let's look at this guy also. I can start here, I go to a right child. Yes, yes. How about this guy? No, because to get to this node, uh, okay, this was a mistake here. I should have put this here. Uh, to go to this guy, I have to actually uh, follow a left child, so this is no. So these are the only candidates that I can use to actually build a V3 for X, Y, given A, B. And in fact, the, the one that we looked at was following this V3, okay? The, the, the conditional PSDD we looked at earlier was uh, structured according to this guy. And you can see this guy actually follows the rules that we mentioned. All right, okay. I wanna end with, with a, an interesting observation. Remember I showed you earlier the compilation of maps and the San Francisco example and so on. Actually, for that to scale, uh, there was an additional idea and uh, I wanna share it with you because it uses this. I, I, I wanna dwell a little bit more on this notion of uh, conditional PSDDs and where they come up. This is uh, cool and uh, some of you may find other examples of this. So let, let me show you the following. We, we talked about the notion of a structured space and there is the notion of a conditional structured space and, and look how, how this may come up. And this is something that conditional PSDDs um, uh, excel at. Suppose I have this map, right? And I, I, I divided it into regions. And what I want to say is, what are the valid routes in this particular region, right? Now, the assumption is someone is navigating. So what is valid as far as the routes in this depends on how you enter and exit that region. There are three different ways I can enter and exit that region. There is E4, E5, and E3. Now, if I tell you that someone entered and exited this region through E4 and E3, that's one choice that defines what is valid routes here, right? Because in a sense that defines the source and the destination. And in this case, these are valid and these are invalid. Now, the reason this is invalid, we know because it's disconnected. Now this is not disconnected, this is connected, but the reason is invalid because it doesn't tie to the entry and exit point. So what's going on here? What's going on is the structured space inside this city is conditioned on how I enter and exit that. So if I tell you I'm entering and exiting E3 and E5, then what is legitimate and the structure space here changes. For example, under that situation, this becomes a valid route. So the, the phenomena that you're having here is, I do have a structured space that is conditioned on another structured space, right? Uh, the, the structure space is here, and, and we're talking about what is the probability over C1 da 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 through C6 conditioned on E3, E4, E5. This is how I enter or exit, and this is how I navigate. Now, I already convinced you that this is a structured space that depends on the values of these. Now, this is also a structured space. Why? Because, can someone tell me why? Uh, there are three points, but only two would be on and the other is off because you can only enter and exit in one particular way you enter, one particular way you exit. So the structured space here is all possible combinations of two. And for each one of them, I have a different structure space. And the compilation of maps uh, use this concept because the idea was I want to talk about the concept that if I want to tell you how I navigate a particular area, that would be independent of how I navigate another area if you tell me how you cross between them. So the idea was that if you're going from one state to another, once you tell me how you're crossing between the two states, then um, your navigation behavior in one state is independent of your navigation behavior of another state. And that is this notion of a hierarchical map. If you tell me how you're navigating westward, west si the west side, right, these E's, then how you navigate each one of these guys become independent. Uh, if you further tell me how you're gonna navigate westward, then how you navigate UCLA versus uh, Westwood Village also become independent. 
this notion of a hierarchical map and these notion of independencies between them coupled with PSDDs was actually needed to be able to compile these large maps. And um, I hope this gives you an idea uh, of how sophisticated this business of compiling knowledge and data can be. This is all knowledge that we're doing here, right? Of various forms, independence constraints, uh, uh, structured spaces and so on. And data in this case is uh, GPS data. Folks, uh, this is what we need to, de to uh, say for today. And um, I hope this gives you um, a very good idea of applications. We'll be doing more applications later. You've waited for long to see some fruits and uh, here's some. Uh, thank you everyone. And I will see you on uh, Thursday.